Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning. It is so good to be here and be back again after being gone last Sunday. Um, our topic today is being still, and we have a special person here to deliver that message to us named Kent Miller, and um, we'll, I'll give you a little more information about him later before he comes and speaks to us, but we're glad to have you here, Kent. So what is still? Is it not moving a single muscle? Well, we were, re we were on vacation last week, and some things I thought about with being still. We were out in nature. Some of us were camping. Sid and I stayed in a cabin. <laughs> um, but we were together most of the time, and we hiked many, many trails and ravines, and they were, some of them were really hard to walk through and get over and ladders to climb and ladders to go down. You know, down in those ravines, down on those paths, nature was alive. There was lots of noise. But inside, I felt still. I felt still. I wasn't standing still. I was moving and trying to balance on walking on rocks and twigs and limbs to get across streams of water. But I was still. And then there were the cicadas. And let me tell you, we know nothing about what the cicadas are here because I rarely hear them or see anything. But down there, they were like a symphony that was shouting at us constantly. Hmm, could we be still in the middle of that? Yeah, we had our campfires, we ate together, we walked, we enjoyed nature. Oh, and fishing. Oh, the patience that it takes to fish. Chris is the only one that caught fish. He caught four catfish. But the rest of us just kept our pole in there patiently waiting, patiently waiting. Still, be still. Um, 
part of the hiking that I thought of in being still was, you know, we were helping each other. Uh, well, let me say they were helping Sid and I and make sure that we were able to keep up with them. And we really appreciated that help, whether it was a hand or whether it was just waiting at the top of the stairs for us to make it up there. And then we had some things happen. First, well, we had a storm on the way down. And Kent's going to talk a little bit about storms of life. But we had a storm going down because we had lights and they didn't stay on. And the one was dragging on County Road 36. We hadn't even gotten over to uh, 31 yet. And somebody went around us and said, hey, something's wrong back here. And here one of the lights broke. And so we went the rest of the way with one light, stopping multiple times to make sure it was on and get it back on right. So at the end of the time, we... Uh, a couple of the guys went and got new lights. Well, long story short, things didn't work out the way they thought, and as we left, we ended up in Crawfordsville for probably, what, an hour or two before we actually made it all on the trip home, before we got lights that worked out. Where is the stillness in that? I'll tell you. It was having Tom, our son-in-law, there with Sid, helping, and they worked together, and I saw smiles on their faces in the middle of that storm. There was community there, and that's part of stillness. And then, last story about that is I was in the uh, Turkey Run Inn, I don't remember why I decided to go over there, but I did. I guess it was too hot outside. I was going to sit outside, but I decided to go over to the inn where it was cooler in their lounge. And I sat down, and I was doing some reading or Sudoku or something. And this young girl came in and sat down across the seating from me. And she was talking on her phone, and she was crying. And I don't, I don't usually like to listen in on people's conversations, but I could tell there was a problem that she was having and she was trying to get help. And so she got off the phone and I, I'm thinking, okay, do I say anything? Do I just go my own way? Do I ignore this whole thing? And something about Jason's messages in the past month just kept sticking with me and I said, no, I need to say something to this girl. And so I did. I went over and I said, I, I'm sorry, but I, it seems like you're having a problem, and is there something I can do to help? And so she explained she had locked her keys in the car. She was just there for the day, and I, I don't know all the details, but she had called her mom, who lived in Lafayette, an hour away, and trying to get her to bring another key for the car. So anyway, I said, boy, I said, I, I really don't know how to help you. I'm not familiar with the area. I know the police don't like to come and do that kind of thing anymore. I asked a few other questions, and then I said, the one thing I can do for you is pray with you. Is, would that be all right if I did that? And she said yes with a smile on her face. And so I prayed for peace for her, and that was stillness, both for me and for her in that moment. Psalm 46, I'll end with this. I'm sorry, I, I had to share some of those things. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. And, or the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shields with fire be still and know that i am god i will be exalted among the nations i will be exalted in the earth 
The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Praise God. Please stand.
You know, sometimes it can seem like we are in caught in a storm, not necessarily changing lights, but maybe we're caught in a storm and maybe our kid has uh, erupting diarrhea and puking during the week and you have to miss work and you get to keep all three boys home because uh, your wife has a job and doesn't have any time off. Sometimes that happens during your week. Uh, that's your storm. Uh, But at the end of all of these storms, God has a promise for us, and his promises hold true, and they always have, and they always will. So let's burst forth into that glorious day that is the return of the king. Sing with me.
Okay, I don't know. Oh, I don't know what I did with my scripture. Um, I know. Um, I got it printed out so I can read it easier. <laughs> Thank you, sis. Okay. Mark 4, 35 to 41. Yes, please be seated. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Kent Miller, who is here to speak with us, has been a pastor at Yellow Creek Mennonite Church in the past, as well as First Mennonite in Middlebury. Yay. Um, and so he comes to us today with a new role uh, that he is doing as an Everance Financial Ed Consult. Consultant. Thank you. I left my paper down there again. <laughs> um, and so I have known Kent, I don't know, we were talking this morning and I said, how long have we known each other? When was the first? And I think it was when Kent was doing youth ministry at Yellow Creek and I was doing junior high ministry here at Olive and we probably met at Camp Amigo often because he spoke there a lot during youth retreats and so forth. And then, of course, his children uh, went to Bethany and our two girls went to Bethany and we ran into each other there. His one daughter is a very good friend of Abby's, so I, I would run into Addie different times with Abby because our girls and Abby were friends. And so there were just those connections. I've, and Kent and I said, yeah, we feel like we've known each other for a long time. I enjoy Kent because he is so full. He's, he's always full of energy, and he has this humor about him that just is relaxing and makes me feel still, Kent. It just, yeah. He, he's one of those people who he can talk to anyone, I think, and make a connection and just bless them. And so, Kent, we welcome you to come this morning. I'm going to pray for him, and then he will come and talk to us about what the Bible says about being still. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you are the creator and author of peace and stillness. And we are so grateful that you want to give us that even when storms come up. And so, Lord, I pray that as you bring your message to us through Kent, that your words and uh, through him and our ears that hear it will just be blessed and challenged to allow you to uh, speak into us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Yeah, all of you out in TV land. Good morning. Yeah, I didn't hear. It is wonderful to be here. Um, I'm, I was really honored when, when Jason asked me to come and share. Um, and it's so many, there's so many faces I know out here. Um, if I pause every once in a while, like I see Ralph and Fannie Mae over there, and uh, as I see people that I know, I, I'm just like, I sometimes go, oh, they're, they're here. That's awesome. Uh, I see people from uh, all over kind of at, at times in my life. Um, as pastor, I was at Amigo as a director for a while. 
And so and what I like to do when I come to speak at a church is I'm going to bring you greetings from Yellow Creek, from Camp Amigo, from Mennonite Mission Network, from Mennonite Church USA, from First Mennonite, from College Mennonite, and from Everence. So thank you for having me be here this morning. I've had quite a journey in life, and through that time, I, I will tell you that there have been many storms. And um, in reality, um, Andy, what you shared before that last song, what Sandy shared, in some ways, I could say like three or four words and, and kind of be done because you've already got kind of that message through the scripture and all of that. But Jason told me I should fill at least 45 minutes to an hour. So that's, that's not right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I am excited to share with you this message because it's one that's continued to be on my heart as I have worked with people over the years in a variety of capacities. And they didn't tell me how to do this, but if I just tap the next one, it will go. Is that correct? All right. Awesome. Um, because there's lots of storms in life that rage, right? There's a lot of storms that are raging all around us. We have natural storms. We have hurricanes, fires, and floods. We have personal storms, right? Things that happen. One of the storms that entered our lives um, really about seven years ago, I can't believe it's been that long, was my, my oldest granddaughter, Sophia, ended up having, uh, was diagnosed with leukemia and walking that journey. That was a day I will never forget hearing about that. These storms rage. We have storms of, of death, divorce, financial struggles, rebelliousness, and then there's community and cultural storms. And of course, the one we've been walking through the last while is the COVID-19. You've got systematic um, injustices. You've got people dealing with privilege, whether it's economic, social, gender, race. There's these storms all around us. And sometimes we're immersed in them, and sometimes we just kind of are on the outside and go, I don't understand your storm. And that's okay, too. We're not called to understand everyone's storm, but we do want to remember that everyone is experiencing something that you probably don't know about. And it's in these storms that blow up and have the potential of just instilling fear within us. I kind of want to look and reflect a little bit on this passage that Sandy read for us this morning. So the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is prone to fierce storms, storms that blow up kind of out of nowhere, and it's done because of the lay of the land. You see, these fierce storms... Can you, can you hit, it's supposed to go to something else on that slide. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I usually have a clicker, and this is very different. It should, there should be other slides that go with that. Is it not coming through? Okay, well, you know what? Imagine with me, if you will, that one of the reasons, I said the lay of the land is that way, right? These storms blow up, and the reason that happens is because there's differences in temperature from the seacoast and the mountains um, beyond. See, the Sea of Galilee lies at, for those of you who like numbers, said, oh, he left. <laughs> those of you who like numbers, the Sea of Galilee lies at 680 feet below sea level. Were you aware of that? 680 feet below sea level, and it's bounded by hills, especially on the east side, where they can reach as high as 2,000 feet above sea level. Now, these heights are a source of cool and dry air, in contrast, directly around the sea, the climate is really kind of semi-tropical with warm, moist air. And so the large difference in height between the surrounding land and the sea causes this large temperature and pressure changes. Okay, For those of you who love weather, this is really kind of resounding with you this morning. What happens is it results in strong winds dropping to the sea. They come crashing down these mountains, funneling through the hills. And the Sea of Galilee is fairly small, but these winds can descend directly to the center of the lake with violent results. So this is where the, the disciples are. And when these contrasting airs meet, a storm can arise quickly and without warning. Small boats that are caught out in the sea are in immediate danger. Now in the passage that Sandy read, we find out that, that Jesus, he was exhausted and he was sleeping 
in the back of the boat. And the storm welled up. And the disciples were freaking out, and they were like, oh no, what's going to happen? And, and somebody glances and sees Jesus is like just sleeping while this storm is raging. And so in this fiercest part of the storm, there's this accusation that happens, this accusation of Jesus, wake up, don't you care about us? We're in a storm where this is amazing and it's, and it's freaking us out a little bit. And so Jesus he gets up and he says, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and the sea calmed. But then Jesus asked them a question. He says, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? And he follows it up with another question. He says, have you still no faith? You see, the disciples have walked with Jesus for a, a decent amount of time at this point. They have watched him perform miracles. They have watched him kind of overcome things that, that you and I, would, our eyes would probably pop out of our heads if we saw that today, right? Jesus was doing that amongst these disciples. A storm rises up and they forget everything. They forget everything. He says, have you still no faith? The disciples, they were in awe. They were this awe that's terrifying at the same time, right? NIV uses the word, I think, scared or terrified is what he said. Uh, NRSB says this awe, like, oh no, awe. And it's rightly so. But there's some lessons from this story that I, I want to bring out, and I don't know if they're actually going to show up up there. So I will say them, and those of you who are really good at dictation can write them down. So I apologize for that. You see, Jesus, when he was awoken, the storm was raging, Jesus did something. He spoke peace into the storm. He spoke peace. He spoke calm into the storm that the disciples were facing. And there would be many more storms that they had to face as Jesus' earthly life continued to unfold. Right? This is not at the end of his life, this is still, you know, somewhere towards more the beginning of the ministry. Enough that they probably should have been aware of what was going on. But he spoke peace in the middle of the storm the disciples were facing. And so the disciples witnessed yet another sign that Jesus is who he claims to be. See, they, they, they were kind of getting it, but they were kind of slow sometimes too. Jesus claims to be the Son of God where even the wind, the rain, and the waves obey him. And see, Jesus provided an example in this, that as the disciples would continue on, they hopefully continued to get, and as we see in later passages, they, they were getting this. You see, the disciples were to immerse themselves into the storms of life and speak peace into those storms. They encountered themselves and the storms that they encountered in those around them, those that they met on their journey. But you know, that's not only for a wonderful Bible story, right? It's not just this idea of, boy, those disciples, isn't it great that they spoke peace into the lives of, of uh, you know, the, the people that they were around that back in Bible times? That's great. Jesus, he speaks peace. And sometimes... Sometimes I'm afraid what happens, and I, I, I take this just as an observation, and it's not everyone, but sometimes when we think about the peace that Christ speaks into the storms of life, we kind of want to be selfish with that. We kind of want to say, you know, I, I need Jesus' peace because I'm facing a lot. Yes, you do. Yes, I do. Yes, we all do. But sometimes we get so focused that we only think that perhaps Jesus' peace is for me, for my family, for my church family. We start to kind of limit that. You see, as Christians, we are to get involved in the lives of others, others in our congregations, our neighborhoods, where we're at work, 
whether it's school, wherever you're at, we're to get involved and to speak peace into the storms that we experience and into the lives of those we meet. Sandy, I loved your story this morning. That, that young lady was in a storm. And, and depending on how your perspective is, some of us might think, oh, it's not that big a storm. No, that was a storm. It was a storm that was bringing tears to her eyes because she was locked out. You see, we're to speak into the lives of those we meet a peace, a calm. We're to speak into the injustices, the prejudices, the hurt, the despair, the locked cars. How often, though, do you and I panic when the storms of life confront us? How often are we so focused on our own storms that we miss the storms that are happening in our friends' and even our families' lives, let alone others we might encounter throughout the day. Now, I'm not trying to say that your storms aren't important, by all means. But did you realize that preparation for the storm happens well before the storm gets there? If you've ever watched what the Florida does when there's a hurricane coming, do they just say, oh, great, a hurricane's coming, let's watch it come? <laughs> no. They prepare right? You and I are called to prepare, to prepare for the storms. Jesus asked his disciples, and he asks us today, why are you afraid when you face storms? Have you still no faith? I've walked with you all these years, or if you're a newer follower of Christ, even these months, I've walked with you. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? He asked the disciples, and he asks you and I today. I truly believe that we need to pray for boldness of faith, that we'll not be shaken by the storms we encounter, and that we might embody and speak peace into the storms in others' lives by offering a few things, offering our time, our shoulders, our tears, our presence, our money, our gifts, our love. I can go on and on. We're called to do that to each person that we encounter every day. I had a good friend of mine a number of years ago. Well, he's still a good friend, but a number of years ago, he um, had someone approach him and they wanted to borrow some money from him. And he had made the practice of, if somebody needed something, to try to help them out. This was a friend of his. And so he gave, right? And, and he didn't necessarily expect it back, but in every other case, people would give back the money until this time. And I'll never forget his face when he was telling me this story. And he said, you know, I've been very trusting with people in this way. But it really hurts to get burned, Right? And it kind of changed him. It, it made him a little sour on helping others out. It took him a while because that felt like it was, he was wronged, that this person kind of took his money and, and then kind of exited his life. We're still called to help. We're still called to, to find ways, and perhaps in this person's scenario, it would have been great if someone would have come alongside and said, well, well can, I, can I help you find some, some help that gets you on your feet, not just by giving you money. We'll take care of the immediate. That's fine. But are there ways, maybe you need some, some counseling when it comes to money. Maybe you need to talk to someone about where things are at. See, to be resourced in such a way that I can help someone, not necessarily all because of who I am and what I know, but, but you know people, right? You know people that have abilities to to reach out and help them, maybe with things that you're not able to. I really, I really pray that we will seek out those who can help provide peace in our storms or in the storms of those we know. Now, as pastoring, I often have people come to me with help in their marriage. It could be with their children, with their finances, with their temptations. And so often, there was this fear in their lives that 
often delayed our getting together. A fear that too often caused them to put things off until whatever was happening became too difficult for them to ha- handle. Most of the time, it was because they didn't want the pastor to know. Right? Now, now what does that evidence? Go ahead, anyone. I'll repeat it if, so the people online can hear. What is that evidence? If they don't want the pastor to know, what is that showing evidence of? Guilt, pride, yeah. Mistrust, yeah. You see, and and I'm I'm speaking as, as both a pastor and a financial consultant, people hold their money and their financial situation very close to the vest. We're often terrified someone else is going to find out either how little money we have, how much money we have, how much debt we have, or the fact we might not have debt because they're like, I don't want people to know my stuff, right? And when you face a struggle, and I have people come, I don't want to just make you think it's people who only have issues with not having enough to meet their financial needs. I had people coming to me and say, the Lord has blessed me, and I'm struggling with, with how to handle this, how to, how to know where I can best further God's kingdom. How can I, can I deal with the fact that I have plenty Maybe even too much. That's a burden and a struggle. And some of us go, well, I like to have that struggle. You know? Yeah, we all would. <laughs> Somebody said amen for those of you on here. Yeah, we would like to have that. And I pray that if I'm ever in that scenario, that, that I would be able to say, I have a plan, right? I have a way that I know I'm going to try to be faithful in how I handle that. Well, people delayed coming with their struggles. They felt guilty. They were embarrassed. They were prideful because they couldn't handle their difficulties that they were facing on their own. I finished my congregational ministry at First Mennonite in Middlebury a couple years ago. It's been a little over three now. And a large part of my reason for going to work at Everance was to intentionally help people find ways to faithfully handle decisions about their money as they find ways and seek ways to kind of integrate their faith and values into all parts of their lives, including financial decisions. You see, so many struggles that I spoke with people about while I was pastoring originated in how they viewed and how they handled money. Way more conversations about that than marital issues or issues with the home. One of the things that I think we don't often realize is that we, we, we think money is probably not something that preachers should preach about. I don't know what your feedback has been to Jason. You, you can tell him whatever you want. But if you take a look at, at how many times different things in the Bible are mentioned, the number one thing that's mentioned throughout Old Testament and New Testament has to do with money and stewardship. Number one. It's like over 2,500 depending on the translation. You talk about the love of God, it's a couple hundred. It blows us away when we realize money is so intricately connected to who we are and how we engage the world. People struggled, whether they had a little, whether they had a lot. And now as a financial consultant and as a pastor, it still requires us to realize that God has given us the resources we need To achieve the peace that Jesus speaks about, we simply need to ask God and to ask others and to get involved. And it starts with taking time. It starts with taking time to be still and to be quiet before the Lord. It doesn't end with that, but that's where we need to start. We need to allow the peace of Jesus to cover us before the storms and in the midst of the storms. You see, praying and speaking peace into other lives, others' lives begins with us setting aside the frenetic pace of the world around us and spending time in the calming presence of Jesus, finding peace in our own storms, in our own struggles, and in the things that we may still need to learn or to realize. Not just praying to ask for things and results, but listening and soaking in the peace of Jesus, using the resources that are available to us 
so that we might inhabit and share the deep and the abiding peace of Jesus with those that we meet in our families, at work, at school, wherever we find ourselves, at the grocery store. There's all kinds of opportunities. It starts with us inhabiting the peace of Jesus. I want to close with a song, and this song is called Peace Be Still, and I'll, I'll sing it, a couple of, there's a couple of verses to it. Um, and uh, as if you, it's a very simple little song, and as you pick up on it, please feel free to join along. And the words aren't going to go up, are they? <laughs> no, okay, wait, 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 there we go. Come back to that. See if it comes. I love technology. Remember when we used to just project them on the wall? I go to this one. All right. says peace peace be still lifts his hands peace be still like a child the winds obey him when he says Peace be still. He says, Peace, peace be still. Lifts his hands, peace be still. Like a child, my heart obeys him. When he says, peace be still. Let's sing the first verse and join with me if you can. He says, peace, peace be still. Lifts his hands, peace be still. Like a child. The winds obey him when he says, Peace be still. Like a child, the winds obey him when he says, Peace be still. When he says, peace be still, when he says, peace be still. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your example. We thank you that you are peace in the middle of our storms. We pray, Lord, that as we go about each day, that we would continue to immerse ourselves in your presence, to soak up who you are, that we might be ready to take on the storms of life. Lord, I pray that we'll be willing to reach out and to ask for help from our sisters and our brothers, from our pastors, from our friends. As we struggle with the storms of life, may we be an example to those around us. And even as we do that, Lord, may we reach into the lives of others and speak peace into their lives. We ask, Lord, that you would go with us to help us, not only in the storms, but help us to praise you in the calm. That We might be still, and even when it gets crazy, we know that you're in charge, you're in the boat with us, and you speak peace into those storms. We pray all this in Jesus' name.
Bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's glorious face shine upon you and give you peace.